It is my great honor to introduce our first speaker of the symposium, Dr. Philip Poole, all the way from England, who is our keynote speaker for this session. Dr. Philip Poole obtained his PhD at Murdoch University, Western Australia at rhizobium um, on nit rhizobium nitrogen fixation. He did his postdoctoral research in Department of Biochemistry, University of Oxford with Judy Armitas and bacterial chemotaxis. In 2003, he subsequently established his own research group at the University of Reading, where he was appointed lecturer in microbial uh, physiology and progressed to a personal chair. He moved to the John Innes Center in Norwich in 2007, and later in 2013, he took up a personal chair as professor of plant microbiology at the University of Oxford. Dr. Poole's research focuses on bacterial genetics and molecular biology of plant-associated bacteria, exploring the uh, physiology of bacterial growth, survival in the rhizosphere, and how bacteria establish symbiotic interactions with plants, including root attachment and colonization. A further focus of his work is the physiology and biochemistry of nitrogen fixation in legume nodules. Recently, his group has developed methods to revolutionize the whole research area of how plants control microbial root microbiome. Today, he will be talking about improving legume symbiosis or engineering cereals. Let's welcome Dr. Philippe Poole for his talk. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat during the talk. Well, I'm, I'm gonna say thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'll just start my uh, presentation and hopefully uh, it'll all go very smoothly across the airwaves. Uh, so, okay. So hopefully you can all see that, and I'm I'm sure the uh, host will tell me if there's okay. So that's great. So um, of course, what I should be doing is actually being somewhere down here at the moment, but like everyone. Uh, we're all a bit dislocated. I'm actually in a little market town about five miles from Oxford where I live because at the moment I'm banned from the lab. That's only for the students. But it's, so it's a great pleasure really to come today and talk about uh, the topic of legume symbiosis and really try and look at uh, how we can use symbiosis uh, as legumes in agriculture, but also the broader topic of what about engineering cereals and engineering microbes to be able to associate the cereals. So I'll try and deal with those two topics, one after the other. First of all, just a very uh, brief overview of the general area of using rhizobium as a model, model both for nitrogen fixation interaction with legumes, but also the uh, association of microbes in the microbiota in soil. So it's a very useful organism because we know so much about it and we, we've got model systems that we can work with, but using it as an example of how other microbes are attracted to roots. So if we just look at the general uh, processes that we should be thinking about in how microbes associate with plant roots, this is just a little uh, cartoon we put together a, a few years ago for Nature Reviews and Microbiology. We have to think about being attracted to roots in the first place, the chemotaxis and the attraction to roots and exudates from roots. In the case of uh, legume roots, we know that there are flavonoids which are released by the plant, which are going to induce gene expression, not factor production by the bacteria. And that's going to initiate the signaling between the, the plant and the microbe. But there's also a whole bunch of other things going on. Plant inducers, which are, in, are inducing plasmid transfer, that's inducing the transfer in rhizobia, and I'm sure other bacteria in the rhizosphere. So again, we're getting this very intimate dialogue. We then really have to start thinking about rhizobium, they actually attach to plant lectins. They use a, a particular sugar uh, at one pole of the bacteria, which enables them to specifically attach to lectins. But so we have in this case, an attachment to root hairs. We also should be thinking about generally about a, attachment and colonization to root surfaces. And this is going to involve the formation of biofilms. And clearly, we're then going to have, in the case of rhizobium, this very specific signaling whereby we're going to establish a nodule. 
So if we look at that in just a little bit more detail before I start talking about some of our work, this is just reminding me in some ways, and perhaps probably reminding most of you in the audience who have seen some of this at least, that rhizobium is attracted uh, by plant flavonoids. Those flavonoids actually induce so-called nod genes in rhizobia, and the nod genes encode the production of these lipokyto oligosaccharides, which in turn signal back to the plant to actually induce nodule formation. What's going alongside this signaling is generally, but not always, attachment to root hairs. The root hairs curl over, they entrap the rhizobium. Uh, the plant then actually develops a, an infection thread, which is a modified cell wall, down which the bacteria grow. And at this point, the bacteria are still outside plant cells. So, so the plant is allowing the rhizobia to grow down through these infection threads but at no point at this stage of the, the rhizobia intracellular. These infection threads actually ramify through the developing nodule. This is just shown as a single infection thread here, but actually they start branching and ramifying. And as, this is, as the infection thread is going through the cortex, in fact, a nodule begins to develop. Uh, a meristem develops uh, and, and a nodule is formed from cortical cells. And, but eventually what happens is the rhizobia are actually released from infection threads and they're actually engulfed by plant cells and they become surrounded by a plant membrane as intracellular uh, uh, organisms. And it's at this point where we start calling them bacteroids rather than bacteria and it's where they start fixing nitrogen. And in that process, we're going to get an exchange. This is just showing you here, I should say, in that process, there's these, these are the bacteroids here. In the case of a P, we can see a single bacteroid surrounded by a plant membrane. We can see it become polymorphic, and I'll show you some other pictures of that later on. And it's while they're inside these infection, inside these so-called symbiosomes, where the bacteria begin fixing nitrogen, bacteroids fix nitrogen, and release it primarily as ammonia, but also as alanine to the plants. And in return, of course, they're receiving carbon, oxygen, and mineral nutrients from the plant. This, if you look down here, this is actually an infection thread, and these actually are effectively free living bacteria which have been growing down through the infection thread. Uh, but here you can see they've then been engulfed once they've been taken up and intracellularly uh, accommodated by the plant cells. So that's the background about uh, legumes. So one of the ways we like to look at that is to consider it as a life cycle. And so we, we should be considering that we start off with free living bacteria, they're attracted to roots. Uh, they, they bind both to root surfaces and particularly to root hairs. And in that root hair uh, binding, we're going to get an the initiation of nodule formation. We're going to have the rhizobia entering the, entering first of all, the root hair itself and then growing down into the cortex. We're going to have a nodule form and this is where we're going to get nitrogen fixation. But eventually, of course, we're going to get release. And so there are multiple stages to consider uh, for, for legume infection and for nodulation, but many of these processes, of course, apply to all bacteria uh, which are part of the root microbiota. Not nodule formation particularly, but certainly many of these st stages of attraction uh, and adhesion to roots and colonization. So first of all, let's just have a look at some of the things of what we tried to do to understand attraction. And one of the first things um, and colonization, and, and one of the first things we started doing is thinking, well, how can we map this process? Because actually one of the issues here is that it's spatially uh, highly resolved. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. And so we started developing, we, we went back to some sort of oldest technology in many ways. These are simply uh, lux fusions. This is just showing that we've taken the promoter of the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene and, and we've, we've hooked it up to Lux genes uh, and the Lux genes will give us light production in this case because it's the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. We only get light being produced when the bacteria are actually grown on phenylalanine. But we could develop a whole bunch of these sorts of uh, 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 Lux fusions. And the advantage of them is that you can use them to map uh, the secretion of metabolites on roots. And so this is just showing some very early uh, pictures we produced of a whole bunch of different types of Lux fusions that we could develop so that these fusions are then specific for a range of important compounds that allow us to study the interaction of the bacteria. And 
to actually give you a more concrete example of that, this is an example where we took some of our most interesting fusions. And these actually are pea plants. What we've done here, we've cut a little hole, these like square dishes uh, where they're growing on, on um, uh, a nutrient medium. Uh, with a piece of paper uh, over the top of the nutrient medium. Uh, the shoot is actually growing out the top here um, and the root is confined inside this sterile chamber. But where we've then inoculated, for example, rhizobia, which have a lux fusion to that same phenylalanine I showed you. And you can see, for example, here that we're getting nice production of phenylalanine released by the plant roots at four days. You'll notice we also see it at 18 days but I hope you'll notice it's very punctate. You're seeing it now in very discrete little blobs on the uh, roots. In fact, these are nodules. And so now we're seeing that we're getting phenylalanine is, continues to be produced inside the nodules and the bacteria are being exposed to it. Just compare that to sucrose, because of course the carbon that's coming down to roots and down to, down to nodules is, is in the form of sucrose. But that really isn't getting outside. It's, it's very, very little signal uh, for sucrose. It's staying inside the roots. But when we look at the nodules, of course, which have now developed by 18 days, uh, we've got this huge signal of sucrose being pumped into the nodules to fuel nitrogen fixation. And you can compare that to other compounds like malinate, which is clearly a, an organic acid that's released by pea roots, at least very early on, four day old roots. But it's, it's not uh, or four days post inoculation, but by 18 days after we've inoculated the uh, roots, there's almost no signal at all. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's being released very, very early. We see somewhat similar for succinate. There's a little bit of a succinate signal, but not very much. But again, a massive signal in nodules because that sucrose comes down from the shoot to the nodules. It's converted into succinate and malate, and succinate and malate are the carbon sources the bacteria receive, or the bacteroids receive to fix nitrogen. And we can also see compounds like GABA, which is absolutely specific for nodules. It's only made in nodules uh, and in pea nodules in particular. We don't see it uh, released at all, and we only see it in mature nodules. So this was just setting up a technique which would allow us to get spatial and temporal mapping of the presence of metabolites in the environment. But of course, you can do the same thing for gene expression uh, where you think there's some particular uh, um, temporal and spatial basis for gene expression on roots. Now I'm gonna show you an example of, of that in a moment. And to, to do that, I want to look at the next stage. We've been looking at this sort of attraction, communication, release of metabolites that are gonna attract the bacteria. But what about adhesion to roots? Uh, what's going on and, and how is that controlled? So here's some work from, um, a postdoc in the lab, Vinoy Ramachandran. And, and what Vinoy did was, this is some quite old work actually, it was microarrays where nobody does microarrays anymore. Um, but we found this little three gene operon, um, which was highly expressed in the rhizosphere. And it consists of this first gene, LPPE, which is a lipoprotein. Next to it is an ECF. So this is a sigma factor, an extra cytoplasmic sigma factor, which is going to be able to switch on a whole bunch of genes. And next to it is an anti-sigma factor. Uh, essentially, the anti-sigma factor stop the sigma factors from acting by binding. So the anti-sigma factor will bind to the sigma factor and stop it transcribing genes. So that as part of the control mechanism. Um, this is just to show you that these, these three genes in, in the P rhizosphere were massively induced, particularly the first gene of the operon LPPE. In our microarrays, we found it almost 100, over 100 fold up regulated in P roots. And, and ECFE and ASFE in this little operon were also slightly upregulated. Uh, we could get a little bit of induction in the labo laboratory by phenylalanine, but this actually is, is a slight um, uh, misconception, or perhaps misconception is the wrong word, but it's a, a, a bit of a, a, a red herring because it turns out a lot of rhizosphere genes are actually induced by phenylalanine. It seems to be a bit of a signal for the presence of the right of, of plant, the, the presence of plant in a lot of bacteria, a lot of genes which are switched on in the rhizosphere 
uh, seem to at least show some initial induction by phenylalanine, which is not surprising because there's so much phenylalanine involved in lignin synthesis in, in plant cell walls. So it's almost a signal that a lot of bacteria are seeing as there's a, there's a plant root around. And so we get a little bit of induction, but it certainly wasn't explaining this huge induction. So what do you do as a bacterial geneticist? Well, the first thing is you make mutants, don't you? So of course we could take our wild type, and we can make mutants in the first gene, in the sigma factor and the anti-sigma factor. And this is simply showing the binding of bacteria to whole roots, a whole root section in quite young, just little seedlings, five day old whole roots. And we actually just incubate the bacteria with these mutations on the roots. And what you can see is, is, is first of all, it makes it strange where the wild type is down here, but this is because we get a huge binding if we actually get rid of the anti-sigma factor, we get massive attachment. And we do also, if we mutate the, we remove with an in-frame deletion of the first gene of the operon, if we remove those genes, we get a huge attachment. You know, it's, it's massive attachment of bacteria to the roots. Now this is, this, what you'd expect here is these, these two genes, LPPE and ASFE are negative regulators. So what that is of course telling us is that this, extra cytoplasmic sigma factor, when you remove the negative regulators and you get very high expression of ECFE, you, you, you're getting huge attachment. But one of the things that really mystified us was when we mutated the ECFE itself, we didn't actually get less attachment than the wild type. So this didn't really make sense to us. The negative, we get rid of the negative regulators, massive attachment. We get rid of the positive regulator itself. We don't seem to be changing attachment very much. So we thought we'd better look at this in a bit more detail. And here, what we've done is we've taken our Lux technology and we've made fusions to that LPPE gene. And I hope you can see, this is the same pea plant, but here's the image at two days where the light is showing where LPPE is being expressed. Then it's seven days and then it's 16 days. I hope you can see that the, the expression of this gene is incredibly spatially resolved. This is not being expressed simply all over the root. In fact, we've gone back and wondered how we ever got our microarray result to show such a high induction because it's actually really only being highly expressed right on the root tips. And if we actually go in at much higher magnification and look at that, this is simply the same image, but now we've taken the gain We've really taken the gain right, um, right up and you can see where the expression is concentrated. And this is the same uh, image, but now a higher resolution. You can see in fact, that we're getting expression really just beyond the root tip in the root elongation zone and just back behind the root elongation zone. And this is where we're having this set of genes switched on. Now, actually, if I can get this, uh, hopefully this will play. This is really just a time-lapse image here. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a clock on here at the moment, but this is over 12 hours. At the moment you can't see very much, um, but around about 10 hours, um, you should start to see, you can start to see now, LPPE is now switching on and it's coming on in all cases around the root tips. By about 10 hours after inoculation, we can see that the genes are now switching on. So it's very time and temporally and spatially uh, organized gene expression. Now, we, so to, to look at that in even more detail, we made some GFP fusions and what we did, this is looking specifically at that root elongation zone. We took a constitutive GFP uh, to label all our, our bacteria and we made an LPP cherry fusion. Uh, and you can see here that we get, um, if you look at the overlap, of course, you can see a nice overlap, but it's all on the cell surface. You can see it's not really on the root hairs we're actually seeing that the, the signal is not diffusible. It's actually happening right on the surface of the root where we're getting LPPE expressed. And this of course is only happening in that root, root elongation zone. So we still didn't, hadn't solved the problem of that weird attachment assay, which was saying we could mutate the ECFE and we didn't really see any change where we would have expected a decreased attachment. And, but of course, once we had the spatial data, it occurred to us, of course, 
that the only thing this set of genes is affecting is the root elongation zone. So now we just started looking at root tips. And what we do here is we constitutively label the bacteria with a Lux fusion. So basically now light is simply showing the presence of the bacteria, not induction of any gene, just the bacteria. And you can see here the wild type, right from the root tips, we're getting pretty good labeling. Um, but as soon as we take our ECFE mutant, I think you can see fairly uh, clearly here, we now lose attachment to that root elongation zone. But one of the reasons that we don't see a big change in attachment over the whole root system is actually it's not affecting. The ECFE system isn't, isn't directly controlling attachment further up the root. It's only to this root elongation zone that we're seeing this collapse in attachment. And you might say, who cares? You know, and actually it's really interesting um, because the point is it shows you the danger of research and the little models we come up with. Because how do, how do we all look at root attachment and colonization? What, what most of us do is we take a sterile root system, don't we? We grow a plant, we have it all sterile, and then we throw a huge load of bacteria onto the root system and say, what happens? And of course, bacteria stick everywhere if you, if you put them onto a root system. But what about real soil? And it's really, this is what occurred to us, is we ought to be thinking about soil where the only part of the root which is uncolonized is the growing root tip. It's the part of the root that bacteria have to find and colonize. And so in this root elongation zone, actually we've drawn this a little bit too high in this cartoon. It should really be down here. But I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, and, and what we should be realizing is, of course, as the root grows, the bacteria that were attached here are now in the zone where we have mature root hairs. And as the root hair, as the root grows even more, these same, as I've labeled them, red bacteria are now the ones inside nodules. But of course, at each stage, we've got a new region of root elongation zone, a new piece of root which is available for colonization. But colonizing the pre existing root, where it's pre existing. Uh, colon, uh, colonized already, of course, is, a, is, is really difficult for bacteria. They've got to compete against the resident microbiota. So being able to identify that root elongation zone is absolutely crucial to, to be able to have a competitive advantage to colonize roots. At least that's how we, we, we see it at the moment. So, okay, that just shows something about um, spatial resolution and how important it is in terms of understanding uh, processes like colonization. So we've, we've got ourselves here, we've, we've started looking at communication and adhesion, but we really thought, well, how can we really analyze the entire life cycle that we just discussed earlier on? So there we decided to, to switch to um, this TIC in, in seq transposal mutagenesis, which, which some of you may have heard of. It's just a way of producing mutant pools of bacteria, where you have saturation mutant pool. Each bacterium only has a single mutation in it. Uh, but what you're able to do is then inoculate it onto, in this case, roots, and you recover an output pool. And of course, if the mutation uh, affects the ability to grow in that environment, then it'll be lost in the output pool. And in seq is just a high throughput technique to sequence the location of all the transposons. So you can actually identify where all the transposons are localized in the population at the start of the experiment, in the input pool, and then in the output pool. And you compare the two pools to say what's been lost. And so you get genes which are essential because those genes, if they're mutated, are completely lost, or the, the bacteria or the mutants containing those mutations in those genes are lost. They're essential. Disadvantage just means there's a big decrease in the number of, of, of bacteria. Uh, which still which have that mutation. Uh, neutral doesn't have any effect or advantageous. Uh, some when you mutate some genes, of course, they'll increase in frequency in a particular environment. And we used a hidden Markov model to look at um, the distribution of all the insertions in, in, um, uh, in, in, a, in a population. And therefore what we could then do is we could say, look, let's now take free living cultures and do in seek on them. Let's take bacteria in the rhizosphere and do in seek. Let's take back bacteria, and these are rhizobium leguminous arum on pea plants that are colonized on the root. Let's affect, there's a, there's a way which I won't go into 
of actually looking at the bacteria inside the infection threads. And of course, we can take the nitrogen fixing bacteria out of nodules. I keep going ahead a bit on myself. The only problem here is that each nodul nod nodulation event normally is an infection by a single bacterial cell. And that means stochastically, if you want to get a, a proper statistical model, you have to pick a lot of nodules because each one is only a single mutant has gone into it. So in the end, we had to pick 150,000 nodules. Um, so it took a year just to pick the nodules for this experiment. Um, so that was a fairly long winded process. But the results are really interesting because it meant that we could compare genes which, which prevented growth in the rhizosphere, and then genes which would prevent growth in the rhizosphere, but we'd also lose those mutants out of the root colonize, the nodule bacteria, and these are the ones in the infection thread, and the bacteroids. And so we could go through and categorize the genes required all the way through the development of uh, nodulation in, in a legume. And the importance of this is, I don't want to give you all the details here. Um, there's a lot of, there's, there's probably PhD projects for the next 20 years working on many of these genes. But the interesting thing is that prior to this, we could identify about 30 to 50, depending how you define it, genes which were needed for nitrogen fixation in legumes. But once you take into account the effect of competition, as this is, because it's if you're unable to compete for nodulation, of course you get lost. There's over 500 genes which are needed for nitrogen fixation in uh, a legume plant uh, on, on a legume by rhizobium. So you can see that actually that competition issue is massively important. If you want to be an effective strain, you have to be able to compete in the rhizosphere. You have to be able to compete for entry into, nodule, into the nodule growth down the infection thread. So um, if I simply look at that in, in terms of summarizing that, what we're talking about here is the ability to differentiate into a bacteroid. I'll just start this little movie here. This is just a serial section through a P nodule, uh, and it's useful because it, it shows you uh, what, what the three-dimensional structure is. We've now got to a point where we've got whole cells. Um, uh, 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 so you cut a thin section, and you, it's an SEM, um, an SEM uh, image, but you're cutting thin sections every, I think it's 100 nanometers we were cutting here through a whole nodule section. So that's just running through a nodule and in the end we'll 3D render it. But what we can see in our bacteroid is a whole host of types of genes which are downregulated, uh, a few groups, but particularly nitrogen fixation genes, which of course are upregulated. And this is just showing us a 3D rendering of what bacteroids look like now. They tend to be Y-shaped. They're very tightly packed. Um, uh, and this is just a cartoon showing us that most of things like the ribosomes, the flagella, um, huge changes to the uh, ATP synthesis secretion systems are all switched off. And we have this sort of uh, concentration on the TCA cycle, oxidation of organic acids for production of energy, uh, electron transfer to nitrogenase, we have metal transport, we have a load of heat shock proteins, um, but we have this very specialized cell that we've called an ammonioplast. Um, well, it's, it's an ammonia, rhizobia become ammonioplast because effectively what they're doing is sitting there as an organelle-like structure providing ammonia to the plant. But in doing all this sort of imaging and uh, it occurred to us, well, how, how can you make anything that's practical out of this? And, and it occurred to us that since we're doing a lot of imaging, what would happen if we just took GFP and we did this with the Lux, we found GFP to be better for this and simply took a bunch of different strains of known different ability to fix nitrogen. And we put a NIF-H um, promoter, which is the first gene of nitrogenase is NIF-H. And we took that promoter and we linked it up to GFP and we said, is there any relationship between GFP fluorescence and nitrogen fixation? And actually, we therefore took different strains of rhizobia, we inoculated them onto pea plants and asked how much fluorescence do we get per nodule? And we found actually there's a very good relationship between, if you like, the transcription of NIF-H and the amount of acetylene being produced. And that got us to thinking that, well, 
This is just showing a photon counting camera where we can count individual nodules and very accurately quantify how much fluorescence is coming out of the nodule. Um, and so we thought, well, can we make this truly uh, a, a, a high throughput multi-strain comparison system? Because one of the problems in rhizobium work is this competition problem in that you might have a strain which fixes a lot of nitrogen, but it's not very competitive. Just as we've shown in the INSEC experiment, there are so many factors involved in competition to get into the nodule and fix nitrogen. And so it's always been a problem in getting elite, elite strains of rhizobium because you want them to fix a lot of nitrogen, but you also want them to be very competitive. And how would you ever measure that? Uh, and, and so there's never been an easy method to measure the fixation rates in individual nodules. And of course, this is this simple, simple GFP fluorescence linked up to NIFH is showing us exactly how we could measure fixation in individual nodules in a high throughput manner. So what we did using, you know, simple, you know, the simple sort of synth synthetic biology tricks that everyone uses now, we simply made um, a series of um, cassettes where we put together superfolder GFP with the a synthetic NIFH promoter, which we use as a consensus promoter from rhizobium, um, Lugumazarum. And we also stuck a barcode, an ID of some 20 base pairs, random, or well, not random, the, the, the Gole barcodes. And so we could make a whole bunch of these plasmids. We made 96, but you could have made 196 or however many you liked. And then we simply put them into a whole range of different strains of rhizobium and asked, are there going to be different? Diff, can we actually identify what's in each nodule from the barcode? And can we relate it to the GFP fluorescence to know how much nitrogen it's fixing? We started out just testing a couple of strains uh, and putting different barcodes in, where we also color coded the strains by either putting in a LAC Z, um, a, a cell B gene, which is just codes for beta galactosidase, or glucuronidase, and using differential staining. So we could see which strain was in the two nodules because they would either be pink or blue. And then we could check the barcode. Did the barcode agree with what we put into the, the strain? And it agreed perfectly. So the barcoding worked fine. You could recover the bacteria out of the nodule. You could then sequence it to see what strain it was. And you had an, an output of the potential for nitrogen fixation in GFP. So of course, we then took um, a whole bunch of these strains. Uh, I should show that here, so I've skipped two slides. So now we took these large libraries, we conjugated them into a whole range of different rhizobium. In this case, I think there was some 85 strains of rhizobium. And up to now, no one's ever really ever done anything other than compare two strains of rhizobium at once. And so we could say, look, let's do 85 strains. Let's compete them at the same time. Let's put them in real soil. We put them in a in an organic soil, I say organic in the sense that a lot of different legumes and cereals have been grown in it. Um, and, and so we had a good population of native rhizobia in those soils as well. We could throw them in and then we could actually recover them. We could score the strain occurrence in different nodules. We could show that 79% of nodules were single infections, 20% were actually more than one strain. I should perhaps say, uh, actually, if you looked at the total nodules, some 60% were caused by our strains and 40% were due to native rhizobia, which are not included in this because they were not barcoded. Uh, just to show you how easy this can be, this is actually a picture taken of nodules with a smartphone. Yeah, smartphone um, with um, just standard orange um, um, filter that you'd use for looking at UV uh, on a transilluminator. And um, so you can do very nice images of the GFP um, that way, although we quantify it with these photon counting cameras. Now, what this enabled us to do is to show, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, we came up with a competitive index, but this is just showing again, this strain GO83 is the, is the one in most nodules, but also we could actually show the, we're plotting here strain occurrence versus the log of the fluorescence. And up here actually is GO83. It's not only is it the most competitive strain, it also is the best fixer of nitrogen according to our GFP fluorescence. So then of course we thought we'd better measure this. So we could now take the individual strains, we took three of our better strains. We looked at how much acetylene is being reduced 
Acetylene reduction is, a, is an assay for nitrogenase because the nitrogenase enzyme likes reducing triple bonded substrates. So it'll reduce nitrogen to ammonia, N2 to ammonia, but it'll also uh, reduce acetylene to ethylene, so a triple bonded to a double bonded substrate. And so it's a very easy way to measure a total nitrogenase activity. And it's, it is indeed higher in that strain. And that's reflected in higher dry weights of the plants at eight weeks. And in case you need a picture to show you, this is the pea plants here inoculated with GO83 versus uh, the, two of the other reasonably good strains. And this is a strain here, which is uh, or a, a pea plant grown uh, without any added nitrogen, of course, and it's not inoculated. And you can see it's yellow and it's, it's dying. Um, it has very low um, dry weight. So the point here is, this is a way of, of really being able to compare the competitiveness of strains in real environments on a whole host of different plants. And actually, I think this sort of uh, um, technology is very suitable for rhizobia, but also the idea of making libraries of tag strains for doing competition experiments to looking at microbiota assembly on roots of different species is also a very, very powerful technique um, that we think you know, really is starting to gain should gain a lot of use uh, in the uh, in in plant microbe interactions. Okay, so I just wanted to then talk about the other side. Um, we we understand a lot more about rhizobium, um, but there is a lot of uh, interest in engineering nitrogen fixation into plants, um, both in terms of trying to engineer bacteria as sort of epiphytes or endophytes of roots. Um, but ultimately also to get nodules on cereals. Uh, but of course, nodules don't fix any nitrogen. It's only the bacteria inside the nodules. So we have a, a big collaboration um, to try and understand signaling between plants and microbes, because uh, the, the, the feeling I had was that as a bacterial geneticist, the contribution we could make to this would be to try to establish signaling, synthetic signaling, between plants and microbes. Because if you want to have a nitrogen fixing bacterium in an engineered cereal, you have to be able to control genetics in the bacteria as well. And you have to have it, the plants controlling the genetics. So the idea we had was to take, and initially to take the rhizobia, of course, because actually they're, they're quite likely to be the sort of bacteria you would want inside a, a synthetic nodule anyway. And the idea we had, of course, is that we could probably recapitulate the idea of lipochyto oligosaccharides from rhizobia if we could control their synthesis to talk to the plant, but we needed a signal from the plant to the microbe to control gene expression in the microbe. Now, of course, in legumes, this is naturally flavonoids. So we're really trying to find another signal, a synthetic signal that we might be able to develop uh, to control gene expression in the bacteria. And once we have the ability to switch genes on in the bacteria, we could switch on nitrogen fixation. We could switch on hopefully ammonia release. We could switch on um, potentially things like antibiotic synthesis and phosphate solubilization, um, hormone biosynthesis and so on. Um, and so that was the idea. Um, so how do we go about trying to study that and, and what could we do? Well, this is a picture of a bean plant, a phaseolus bean plant that we sometimes work with. And it's just re, uh, reiterating that what we have is uh, carbon sucrose coming down from the shoot. It's being provided as a dicarboxylate to the rhizobia to fix nitrogen and provide ammonia back to the plant. That's all very well. But something that had been discovered uh, oh, 20 years ago now um, is that or may even be 30 years ago let's have a look it's it's in fact it just shows you i'm getting too old now uh peter murphy and um uh first did this work 33 years ago 34 years ago boy i'm getting too old um but uh uh what we what was what peter showed was that that rhizobia inside nodules a few species could actually modif make these modified rhizopenes. They're modified in nosotol derivatives. They're called rhizopene. One of them's a thing called 3 -metho methyl skiloanosamine, and another one's just skiloanosamine. They just differ in um, uh, the, 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 the presence of, the, of this methyl group up here on the 3 methyl, um, and that's the only difference between these two compounds. Now, what was shown back in the, the dim distant past 
was theoretically that these three genes seem to code for synthesis and this was the catabolic cluster. Uh, it turns out this was, uh, and from that a proposal was made for the synthesis of these compounds. Actually, we started thinking, well, what happens? Could we take these genes and put them into the plant? Could we get the plant to start making rhizopene instead of the, instead of the bacterium? And could that become a signal, a more general signal to control gene expression in a wider range of bacteria? The first problem we had was the pathway that had been proposed was all wrong. The second problem we had was you can't buy any of these compounds. So fortunately, um, one, a, a top inositol chemist happens to be working, in, has a research group in, in chemistry at Oxford, and we could collaborate with them to actually synthesize all the various derivatives that we needed. And we could then show that actually the pathway that had been established was wrong. The natural pathway doesn't start with a nosotol, it starts with a nonotol. Um, there's an anonotol dehydrogenase in that pathway, which had been missed originally. It produces keto anonotol, and then there's an amino transferase, which produces this three OMSI. At that point, we realized we had trouble. This complex is a very complicated periplasmic complex in bacteria. There's no way we could ever express that in plants successfully, although we did try, of course, but there's just no way. It's, it's such a different cell structure. You're never going to get that to work in a plant. But it occurred to us we could come up with a synthetic pathway, which was to actually oxidize inositol to keto inositol. And that would then probably give us a keto acceptor that we could get transamination to form skilo inosamine, which is one of the other natural um, rhizopene derivatives. Uh, and so we thought this might be our way forward. And so actually then our collaborators, uh, which is, uh, I showed you that uh, um, Barney Geddes was the postdoc working in my lab. He's now back in, back in, uh, in the States actually, back at North Dakota, he has his own faculty position now. Um, but Ponraj is still at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge, working with our collaborators, Giles Aldroyd, who's working on the nodulation pathway. It's a big Gates project to try and establish nodulation in cereals. Um, and uh, Ponraj actually took the genes we suggested and he could show in transient infection of tobacco, as long as he had the two genes we were suggesting, he could show um, that skilo uh, nosamine was being made, or he could do it in root organ culture of metacargo or in hairy roots. So basically, we were getting production of rhizopene, uh, skilo nosamine in uh, the roots of these plants, uh, both of uh, tobacco and metacargo. So what are we gonna do with that? Well, the first thing is we want some way of seeing whether or not that's going to switch on anything in the bacteria. So we went back to our Lux type technology again, and we took the actual the catabolic genes for rhizopene, which, the, which a few species of rhizobium have naturally. And they have this regulator MOCR, which almost certainly binds rhizopene and switches on these so-called mock genes, which are required for catabolism of rhizos, rhizopene. And one of the first ones is, is, is the first gene in the operon is mock B, and it has the so-called mock B promoter. We just linked that up to Lux genes again. So we had simple biosensors to see whether on our bacteria we're able to detect the presence of rhizopene. So doing that, the first thing was to actually say, well, um, okay, can we actually see anything? And, and this is just looking at a, a bunch of different rhizopene derivatives. Of course, as I said, uh, uh, Emily Joffrin, um, who works in Stuart Conway's group, or she did, she's, she's a postdoc now. Uh, I think she went to MIT um, um, after, after Oxford. Um, and she was able to synthesize skiloinosamine and the two stereoisometric um, forms, the L and the D form of the methyl deriv derivative. It's really important for us because then we could actually take our biosensors and we could say what the heck was actually inducing the, uh, the genes. And of course, it turns out um, that it's the L isomer. You do get some induction by the D isomer, but it's over tenfold reduced relative to the L isomer. And you can get induction by um, SIA, so this skiloinosamine as well. And this is just showing the induction curves over here. 
So this enabled us to show what was the natural forms of the of 3OMSI. It enabled us to show that skiloenosamine um, actually uh, would induce the system. It uh, and, and we could go through and look at all the a whole bunch of other derivatives uh, and, and none of these things would have any, any induction. Um, one of our problems actually in doing this research is that some of the intermediates that we were using in this uh, to synthesize skiloenosamine and, and, and to show the chemistry of it, they were so unstable. Uh, Emily had to make them in chemistry and then literally run across the road to plant sciences because we're separated by a, a small road in Oxford. Um, with this on ice and rush it into, into our lab uh, to do some of the enzymology. So we, we showed all the um, steps, but with pure, pure protein and, and with the pure enzymes and could show them in mass spec that we were producing the right compounds. But, but it, was, it was fun with those intermediates that were sort of breaking down with half-life, a half-life of a few, a few minutes. Um, okay, so we, we'd shown what the chemistry was going on what, what, could, what would happen now on plants? So now we have stable transgenic plants. We have stable metacargo truncatula. We have stable um, lines of barley with these two genes. That's all we have to have, two genes, the inositol dehydrogenase and this transaminase gene in there. Uh, and we can actually get, uh, and this is just showing again with our Lux fusion of our bacteria inoculated onto the outside of the roots, showing in this case, this is metacargo. This is the control, which doesn't have the rhizopene genes. This is with the rhizopene genes. We can now get switch on of our bacterial uh, lux fusion. And the same on barley. We're getting a very nice production of rhizopene. And importantly, it's being released out into the rhizosphere. So it's, it's a mobile compound, which is now able to be a signal uh, that we can detect in, in the bacteria. So that means we've actually got a signal. So what can we do with it? Um, that's the next question. And so at this point, um, the, uh, the, this was work that was particularly done by Marta Mendes here. She's actually laughing because we were, we were um, punting on the Charwell River in Oxford and Marcella, who did a lot of the earlier work had just fallen in the river at the time. Um, but, um, Marcel, uh, Marta um, was the one who was really doing this work. And the, the thing to understand here is this is actually looking now, can we use the rhizopene as a signaling molecule to switch on nitrogen fixation? So to test this, we took azorhizobium colinidans, doesn't really matter about the species. Um, and azorhizobium um, is a rhizobium which, which will nodulate some species of le tropical legumes. Um, but it also fixes nitrogen in the laboratory, which is unusual for rhizobia. Most of them don't fix in the laboratory. But this just shows you the genes in azorhizobium, the, the nitrogenase cluster. It's a huge cluster of genes. The whole, I'm not going to talk about nitrogenase other than to say it's complicated to make all these horrendously um, complex uh, iron sulfur and iron sulfur molybdenum clusters. But it turns out there's one really important thing. The nitrogenase genes, there are several promoters in here, but they're all switched on by this master transcription regulator, NIFA. So of course, the obvious thing to, to do was simply to take, the, take out the native promoter of NIFA and put a rhizopene promoter in front of it. So could we now make the NIFA gene, the NIFA regulator, respond to rhizopene? And this first uh, plot here, you can simply see this is the wild type, um, this is just showing uh, NIFH expression. Um, of course, it can be induced um, naturally by low oxygen in azorhizobium, uh, and there's no effect of adding um, rhizopene. Um, if you take, uh, if you if you delete the NIF NIFA gene, this is delta NIFA. Um, well, there's there's nothing happening either. This is just background cherry um, no, fluorescence, I should say. Doesn't matter whether you add any rhizopene. Now we take this same delta NIFA strain, but we put back, in this case, on a plasmid, NIFA, but controlled by the rhizopene promoter. And I think you can see if we don't put rhizopene, we don't get any NIFH expression. So NIFH is the first gene in this, uh, in this cluster, NIFHDK. Uh, here it is down here. Uh, it's the, these, these are the structural proteins for the iron protein in the iron molybdenum protein. 
and we use that as our, our, our detection of transcription. And you can see now we get good induction, very good induction, almost to wild type levels, even using um, a, a weak ribosome binding site uh, and with a strong ribosome binding site, uh, slightly higher expression um, of the uh, NIFH. But we're now making NIFH switched on by rhizopene, not by the native signal from NIFA. But of course, that's just one gene or a fusion to one gene. We then went and measured acetylene reduction. Here we go again. This is our wild type. Um, doesn't matter whether we put rhizopene, no rhizopene in there. Of course, we don't need rhizopene to induce the genes uh, to get nitrogen fixation. If we take our delta NIFA with our PMOCB uh, construct, but with nothing in it, just the, just the vector, uh, again, we can't induce any um, nitrogen fixation, the stars, just to say we couldn't detect anything. But of course, if we take our strain, which has no NIFA in the chromosome, but has NIFA under the control of the rhizopene promoter, we can show actual nitrogen fixation once we have uh, uh, rhizopene added to the medium. So we're now getting nitrogen fixation in laboratory culture. And here's the thing you might think you want us to do. This is now taking transgenic barley. So this is just showing the barley um, have the MOSB IDHA genes to make rhizopene. Um, we now have, oops, we now have our NIFA under the MOCB promoter. Um, so we're now generating, we're driving the expression of this master regulator NIFA by the presence of rhizopene. And we have, in this case, we're just, we're now looking back at the if H expression again by linking it up to GFP. So in other words, GFP is going to tell us, are we switching on the nitrogen fixation genes in the presence of rhizopene on a barley root? So this is showing us the wild type where we've constitutively labeled the cells with cherry. And you can see it doesn't matter whether we take the wild type plants or the transgenic plants making rhizopene, we can find bacteria on the roots. They're red, of course. If we look at GFP, which is what, what is our marker for uh, NIFH expression, we have nothing on the wild type and we're getting very nice expression on the roots of the nitrogenase complex uh, in the rhizopene producing strain. And this is just the merge where we're seeing yellow cells, of course, uh, where we have uh, NIFH expression in our bacteria. So we can actually now show that we're clearly getting NIFH expression on the barley plants. The, virtually the final slide is to say, I talked earlier about a signal from the bacterium to the plant, and all that I've talked about so far is the other way, plant to bacteria as rhizopene. We realized, of course, that we ought to be able to um, use a, um, our nod gene expression to do this, but naturally nod genes are switched on by a thing called nod D, and NOD-D is constitutive and it's, it's, it becomes active in the presence of flavonoid. So we needed to change that. We needed to isolate derivatives of NOD-D, the master regulator of NOD genes, which don't require flavonoids, they're flavonoid independent, but where the gene becomes inducible by rhizopene. And so we isolated these NOD, in, NOD independent, fl uh, flavonoid independent, the NOD-FI derivatives. It turns out you just need the first uh, 75 or 80 amino acids of the helix turn helix of the protein and it becomes uh, uh, flavonoid independent. There are some natural flavonoid independent derivatives and we could now show that we could hook those up to rhizopene and in fact we could now get um, we could get the operon to uh, switch on and we could induce nod genes specifically by the presence of rhizopene. We've now subsequently gone on to show that we can actually induce nodules on plants and this is just showing us that, of course, now we could make a whole bunch of different types of derivatives, LCOs, COs, uh, and then whole clusters with the whole decoration that we would expect to see in a legume nodule. And so we have the ability to make a signal going in the opposite direction. So just coming back to this slide, this is then saying, look, we have a signal coming out from the plant. We have a signal going back to the plant. We can control gene expression in the bacteria. We can also complete the circuit by controlling gene expression in the plant. 
uh, by making an LCO because an LCO, of course, there are LCO receptors in legumes and actually in cereals as well. And of course, there are receptors for COs. And there's a major program and a major part of the Gates program is to engineer these receptors so that you could make novel receptors to see novel signals that we could actually engineer in the bacteria. Uh, other things like ammonia um, secretion and so forth, which is another part of the project, which we have engineered that I'm not going to talk about today. And I think I should stop there. I think that's very much, um, if I go any longer, I'm over time. Um, I think I've, I've, helped, I've, I've said thank you to people along the way. Um, this, is, uh, this is Tim, who's been doing uh, most of the, um, uh, the NIF and NOD expression at the last latter parts of this project. There was Marta, I said, doing the initial work uh, on nitrogen fixation. Uh, there's Marcella who did all the barcoding and she's now in Aarhus in Denmark. Um, and uh, the whole bunch of people which were involved uh, in the, um, uh, in, in the, uh, the in-seek experiments and some of them are missing, so I, I won't go into those again. And then I'm gonna stop so I don't run any longer. Uh, and say thank you very much uh, for listening. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Poole, for an excellent talk. I see we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first question is from Santos Kumar, and he asks, does the selected rhizobia based on their nitrogen assay were sensitive to nitrogen concentration in organic soil? We haven't we we haven't directly tested that. Um, it it's it's actually uh, a really important and well established, though, of course, in legumes that if you have high levels of nitrogen in the soil, you can inhibit nodulation, for example. So you would stop the plant from allowing the infections to occur, and that's well known. Um, it is also known that even in natural nitrogen fixing bacteria you often have inhibition of the nitrogenase enzyme by ammonia, for example, the end product. But of course, in rhizobia, that doesn't really happen because they're producing huge amounts for export to the plant. All right, thank you. So there's another question from Bruna, and she asks, do you know what the bacteria are detecting at the root tip of plants to be able to attach there specifically? Ah, oh, it's a really good question. Yeah, the answer is we, we, we sort of know. Uh, it's, it's a plant glycoprotein. Uh, and we, we, but at the moment, we know that only in the sense that we've done simple crude, crude uh, isolation. Uh, we can show it's heat, heat labile, it's protease labile, it's labile to, to digestion with um, glyconases. So we know we're pretty confident it's a plant glycoprotein. Uh, we just need a, a keen PhD student to come and purify it for us. Um, it's sort of ongoing. And then we do know it's a plant like protein. Yeah. Awesome. So there's one more question uh, from Fernanda. She says, thanks for the inspiring talk. I'm wondering whether ARA was detected in barley. Oh, at the end there. Um, we're actually trying to measure that at the moment. Yeah, we're actually in the process of doing that at the moment. Yeah, on, on the barley plants with the engineered strains. So, so yeah, that's that's in fact exactly where we're at at the moment. We're actually measuring that. In, in practice, we don't expect to get huge amounts of nitrogen fixation out of the system at the moment. What we're working towards is towards a system whereby a bacterium would be inside a, a synthetic nodule where we then have all the controls, but we hope to see some nitrogen fixation, yeah. Awesome. I think that completes all the questions we have. Thank you very much, Dr. Poole, uh, for a great talk and for answering all the questions. Thank now, you.